Tonight I'm going to give you a sense of the kind of practice that we have been developing um, over the years. We started in 1998, so it's been just, uh, just made 10-year mark at the practice. So I'm going to take you through some of the different categories. Instead of categorizing our work in terms of the typological um, sections or programmatic uh, divisions, I'm really going to focus more on kind of interest areas and different scales that we've been working. One of the scales is really the material explora exploration and experimentation uh, that we've been doing. Another is the urban projects uh, that are really working more as uh, catalysts for events within the, the city. Um, the third category I see as more living environments, a kind of hyper urban dense living environments. And, and finally, there's a bit of the work that has been um, focused on making interpretive buildings that, uh, that are placed in, in certain sites to interpret the sites. Um, these projects have more of a narrative quality. The, the, first, the first project really has more to do with the material exploration. It's a project that took place right here in this building. It was an exhibition um, put together by the International Masonry Institute to explore the different um, age-old materials and see where those materials might be taken um, for, by the next generation. And we were asked to um, explore the material of stone and to see what possibilities um, could be found with stone, new possibilities. Um, this, this piece hung right in the gallery behind us. Um, it was a, a thin um, sculpture of stone, um, something like 600 different pieces, very thin, hanging from the ceiling in the gallery. Um, for this project, we, we were collaborating with different experts, uh, craft people and um, master craftsmen that had um, collaborated with us from the beginning of the design uh, to come up with um, what could be done with this material. We also worked very closely with engineers uh, as, as well. So there were four different materials. There was stone, um, masonry, terrazzo, and then AAC, which is a kind of a new uh, lightweight um, concrete material. Um, in order to, to think about hanging stone in tension, uh, we were interested in, in the fact that there are new tools and new composite materials. Maybe we could make the stone do more than it originally is known to do, which is to be used in compression. Um, so in order to explore this, we really had to go right into the testing labs right away. Um, here, here's um, a couple of the collaborators from my office working on... Um, putting together samples to be pulled apart in the testing lab to see what strengths this material could, would have once it was pulled apart in tension. Um, it was really necessary to get right down into the details with this and think of all of the different um, composites and geometries in order to, to test what would really be ultimately used um, in the final piece. We have been working with fabrication technologies, um, you know, connecting our drawings directly to um, the, the water jet cutting machines in this case to cut out these different shapes um, and, and seeing what, what kind of synergies we could find with, with the technologies. Here's, here's a shot right in the Great Hall. Uh, we also designed for this piece the, the um, formwork that was used to install it. And here you can see the pieces being laid out. This is the temporary formwork that will be used to create the piece. This is during, during construction. You can see how um, this false work was created. Um, and it, what, what was interesting about this experiment was really not only that we were using very new contemporary tools uh, for the architectural part, but also um, with the master craft worker, Matt Redabaugh, who I think is here tonight, uh, he also used new tools. In this case, um, he was using a laser plumb bob to be able to, to locate the, the, the dimensions of the piece that were not horizontal. And so I think this project really stretched all the, all the collaborators involved in, in new ways um, because stone had never been hung from the ceiling before. 
I think it's, it, this is an interesting image to see because you can see um, Matt right about in the, in the picture, probably the first time he's ever had to build a stone wall from the top down. Um, and he's hanging it from the first row of, of the um, high strength aluminum anchors, masonry anchors, high strength aluminum course, and then these 3 8 inch thick uh, pieces of stone that were cut from tile um, hanging them one from the other. As the, the pieces are hung, uh, the, the weight of all of the stone is taken by the top piece, um, and lateral loads are transferred around the piece through the silicone joints, the vertical silicone joints. This is about when the, it was about halfway complete, and we were all very um, excited to see that the stone was very transparent because it was so thin. And here you can see the, the edge of this, the edge condition of this um, shell, structural shell, uh, only 3 8 inch thick. So each, each of the stone tiles on the inside were layered with some uh, fiber reinforcing uh, laminate, like a, a glass fiberglass, and that, that was able to give the structure its redundancy in case any of these pieces broke, it wouldn't come tumbling down on someone's head. Um, but each piece is hanging from the one above it, making a, a structure that is held in tension from the ceiling um, and, and acting as a shell uh, for its lateral loads. These were some special pieces that we had to make um, as we developed the project. We ultimately found out we wouldn't, weren't able to get the wide enough pieces of stone for the bottom as this flared out, and so we designed um, a particular piece that, that was able to take this chain and divide it into two equal parts. So from a, from a project, an architectural project, it, it's really an exhibition. It's an, it's, um, an installation piece. But I think that some of the qualities of this piece were very important for our practice and the way that we practice and this kind of testing and iterative um, experimental nature of, a, of our work. Um, one other project that I'd like to show um, does something very similar but with a different material. Um, this is a, a project for a, a small house in Chicago uh, that's within a very kind of dense neighborhood. You can see the site plan down here. Um, there were, it was a, the foundations were there for an old carriage house. And for this project, the, the clients had very little money and uh, we were really working trying to weave in this new structure into this existing foundations of an old carriage house. What, what we decided to do with this project was instead of um, just tearing the whole thing down, we, we kept certain walls and, and took away part of the roof to create a front garden uh, so that this house could um, stay occupying its entire lot but kind of subtract some of the mass of this house um, toward the front piece. Um, this is a wall, a, a, a walled garden. The wall is about 24 feet high, and it's only a single wide of brick wide. So it's, it's really um, unprecedented in a certain way because it's, it's spanning so high um, with, without um, a secondary layer of brick behind it. Um, we worked with numerous patterns of the, the, the masonry to achieve this wall. And we also worked again with uh, International Masonry Institute, who we had worked with on the marble curtain, to help us to uh, develop this building. One, one of the problems was that the engineers that we were working with really didn't want us to, to go this high. Um, there's, there's a steel column behind. Let me show you in the plan. Um, but the brick was not allowed by code to, to deflect more than uh, three-eighths of an inch. So we had to stabilize uh, this wall in terms of the structural engineer's um, point of view, whereas working with the, with the craftsmen and the masons, we wanted to allow it to move. So we had these two kind of contradictory 
demands. And so what, what we ended up doing was um, working with the engineering staff of the masonry tie company to, um, to come up with a very small piece which we custom designed um, to, to tie into the, to the ladder truss in the wall. Um, and what I find so interesting about it is like this one little piece is what ended up solving um, the entire wall. This, this is a mock-up uh, during construction. Um, here you can see some of the piece and how it's engaging into the steel structure and the beginning of the final construction. So you, you can see the, uh, the ladder truss is buried within this little bit wider, thicker uh, masonry course, uh, mortar course. And we, because this project was kind of, again, kind of pushing the limits of, of what we could do with this material, uh, we, we also uh, had a structural engineer do a kind of a peer review of our whole project. Even though it's such a tiny project, it was experimental and we needed to, to reassure ourselves that, that this would work. This is a final wall, as you can see, um, installed. It's about, like I said, 24 feet high. Um, and you can see the pattern is really reflecting the true structure of this piece. We had a lot of snow this winter. This was just finished just in time for, just in time for the big snowfall. There's a, quite a lot of diversity along the, this street, as in any neighborhood in Chicago. Um, and one of the unforeseen consequences, I guess, of this design was that people started coming up to the wall and peering through, <laughs> through the brick holes. But what's really amazing is these, this quality of light that is gained <coughs> on the interior um, because of this walled garden. And you can see the different shapes of the light. Those are things that um, you, in a way, unexpected, beautiful uh, qualities. As I said, this was a low budget project. We, we really worked with very uh, few materials, even using IKEA cabinets in the interior. Um, but, but it still pushed a lot of boundaries and was very interesting for our material research. Here it is along uh, the street. And at the end, um, really acting as kind of a lantern in this neighborhood. So we talked about brick. Uh, we talked about stone. Um, now this is a project that, that is really about a research in concrete. Um, it started out as a brick project, but because of the um, budget issues, uh, we ended up pulling off really the, the exterior wall of, of brick and really getting into the under layer, the kind of unseen part. Um, the project is it's a community center for children that are in uh, foster care. And the uh, SOS is an international social service organization that, that ten, they've been around since World War II, and they, they help train foster parents. And they also um, help kind of reunite siblings that were put into foster care and try to get them into the same family. So this project is located in uh, Chicago also. And one of the things that uh, we've been trying to do as a practice is constantly do projects about community um, and, and not just the projects that are high profile, but try to keep one ongoing community project all the time. Um, when we started this project, we, we noticed that we started looking at the different neighborhoods in the city of Chicago and found that there are, Chicago is a place that is constantly mapping itself by race and it, it, it's constantly changing also, but, but there's so many different um, communities in, in Chicago. And at the same time, we were looking at, you know, why is it, architecture is really located mostly in the downtown area. So these little tick marks here are examples of AIA-designated um, significant buildings in the city. 
the, and the red dots are community centers. So if you, if you look at that, you can see that the, there are vast areas without any tick marks. And we were calling these the architecture deserts. So they're, they're just vast areas of the city that is kind of ignored uh, by architects. SOS, the project that I'm showing you, is located in one of the deserts. Um, and I think now we have overall, uh, we have, we're working on our third project in the, in the architecture desert. Um, but what, what is interesting about that is that uh, I think that architecture has such a, a strong um, ability to transform neighborhoods that it's really important that we focus on these areas. And when you're doing projects for social service organizations like SOS, a lot of times you're um, asked to incorporate donations, like in-kind material donations. Um, even the land, the land for this project was donated. It's this very skinny strip of land that's really cut off between these two elevated railways. Um, the red is, is the community center and the, the other buildings within the triangle are the housing for the, the foster care families. So we were trying to come to terms with um, how to incorporate donated materials when sometimes you get them at the very end um, and, and trying to keep track of that. So we came up with a strategy of kind of keeping track of all the materials on a big spreadsheet and allow, being flexible and allowing these things to change um, as as we develop the design. Um, this is the building after we no longer had brick on the building. Uh, we had this very large cantilevered structural concrete wall um, where we were told uh, by the contractors that there was going to be a very ugly cold joint halfway up the wall because that wall cannot be poured all in one, um, in one truck full of concrete. So a lot of times we've been working with criteria and trying to find the interesting opportunities in the criteria. In this case, we had the idea of, of trying to collect um, donations of concrete and actually instead of, reduce it, instead of trying to overcome this cold joint, we would actually kind of celebrate it. And we made these little models of um, made of plaster uh, to, to use as tools to talk to the tradesmen. Um, can you possibly do a wall that has different um, wavy layers of concrete of different mixes? And, and in doing that, we, we found out different mixes that had different structural qualities also. And we used a combined uh, layers of different types of concrete to achieve this cantilever. Here you can see this um, test the, that we made on the elevator shaft. Um, a lot of this, you know, we were doing very fast because we had to reduce the cost and we had to get this building built. Of course, we were pouring this, this concrete in the middle of winter, very, very cold. And after we completed the test, we had to ask our owner's rep and our owner, you know, would you, are you going to approve this? They were kind of suspect. They thought, you know, is this really going to look good, you know? <laughs> all the different layers of concrete. Uh, so we brought them out there, um, 20 below, to look at the, at the layers. And, and, and lucky for us and for the building, they, they approved it and said we could go ahead with doing the building um, in layers. So the way that it works is really the, the, uh, the, the guys that are pouring these different uh, mixes just into a bucket and bringing it up to the top of the wall and pouring it in a very specific place. And what was interesting, we kept the water ratio really low on the concrete, but they still were able to predict exactly how much slump that they would get in each layer. And they, 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 we really wanted them to kind of go off and do their own design, but, but they wanted us to draw it first, so we, we did that. Um, we drew the drawing, and they, they literally matched it almost exactly. So and then uh, this is when the formwork was first pulled off on the cantilevered wall at the entry. And I just I was so excited about this that I 
wanted to really stop the project right there and leave it like that, but of course they wanted a roof and things like that. So um, we continued on. This is the final uh, project. We finally, in the end, we did get a donation of brick, which we reincorporated in, into the, the rest of the building. Um, but what I like about this project, it, it, it really expresses that fluidity, the fluid nature of concrete, which so oftentimes is erased or forgotten after the building is finished. But in this building, it really is preserved and the, the physics of the fluid is, is preserved in the final form. Uh, from the other side of the building that faces the street, we put a very um, large community room up on the second floor. Uh, so it has good views of the neighborhood. That's a space there. Um, and the, there's a daycare that connects to the, the neighboring um, housing. And it's basically just a very, very simple trying to organize the elements to be neat, not, not having a very large budget at all, and working with, like I said, a lot of the donated materials. At the entry, there's a, a giant stair that we um, designed into the lobby so that when you come into the building, you kind of come underneath the stair, and it doubles as a, a cinema seating for the kids, and they also have after-school classes there. Um, and it's almost like this giant jungle gym uh, that, that the kids immediately start running up and down when they get in to the building. Um, and that space is quite dynamic with its diagonal focus out to the, the existing neighborhood. Um, these are just a series of shots that show the changing light because I think there's something very much in common with uh, the, the fluidity of the... Um, the clouds that you see, and they also embody this kind of change of state. So now I'm just moving into the category of work that I call urban projects that are catalysts. Uh, some of these are built, others not. Um, and again, uh, the research is really kind of supporting this, this work. Um, a lot of this project was done with research uh, completed by IIT students, you know, teaching studio. Um, and we were really interested in, in how major event spaces like stadiums, how do they impact uh, the neighborhood around them and, and what is their role in, in the city? Um, we were interested in the fact that Chicago has these two baseball stadiums. One is for the Chicago Cubs up on the, the north side, and one is for the White Sox um, down on the south side. They, they have so much in common. They're both about uh, just, they're about four miles from the city center, each one. They're both located on a train line, um, but the neighborhoods around them are completely different. Um, Wrigley is really embedded into the neighborhood. There's buildings coming right up next to it, whereas um, Comiskey Park or U.S. Cellular, it, it's surrounded by single-use parking lots. And the Wrigley Field on the north is seen as kind of an asset to its neighborhood, and Comiskey and U.S. Cellular Park is really seen more as a detriment to its neighborhood. So why are they so different, and what, what makes them that way? We looked at the stadiums. Uh, the stadiums are completely different sizes. Wrigley is on the left. It's an old stadium, um, probably finished in about 1903 or something like that, um, last time the Cubs won the World Series. And um, <laughs> um, U.S. Cellular is a much larger, newer stadium. And you can see how what's happened here, the insertion of many more levels of building uh, to serve the, um, there's some kind of exclusive box uh, seating and also a heightened um, stadium that allows everybody to have a perfect view. Here at, at Wrigley there are some encumbered views. But even though U.S. Cellular you know, went ahead and built a new stadium, their attendance is still you know, pretty poor. On average about 20,000 people even though they can seat 46. Whereas the Cubs attendance 
even though they're a horrible baseball team, um, they still can pull in something like average of 33,000 people, even in, you know, in any year, no matter how bad they are. So it tells you something about the architecture, I think, and the, and the city in which they're located. What we found with the students was we went around and mapped the different parking spots. The red is parking. This is U.S. Cellular on the left and Wrigley Field on the right. And we found that the parking is much more dispersed. It's really a network of parking, even like multi-use lots around churches. Some people even park even like two cars in their own garage during an event. It's an aerial view of the two. And at Wrigley Field, the stadium almost spills over to the neighboring buildings. You can see people on top of the roof watching the game here, um, which expanded to something like this with all of these rooftop seatings. And further, even double-decker rooftop seating. There's even a section in the Chicago Building Code specifically about rooftop seating at Wrigley Field. <laughs> um, so we, we love this aspect of the stadium, the fact that it could be totally exploded uh, when, when there's a game and then retract and almost be invisible when there's no game. This is a view you can rent these spaces. As you can see, it's not a perfect view of the game, but people just like to be there to see other people and to experience the event. Uh, we studied a lot of other uh, stadiums throughout the country. I love baseball because it's, it's not um, consistent with the fields. You can, you can have a lot of variation in the actual playing field. Uh, Fenway is a good example of that. We looked at where these stadiums are positioned in the country. And then we came up with this idea. Um, right around this time, we were asked by, the, um, by Architectural Record to participate in the Venice Biennale and to explore, to show our work on stadiums. But at that point, we really hadn't designed anything in stadiums. We had just done all the background research and were kind of trying to understand it. So we had to quickly, in about a month, come up with an idea, which basically the, the thesis here is that the stadium is a piece of infrastructure and it needs to be located on top of other infrastructure, like parking garages, maybe the empty out at the end of the day, um, subways. And, and in that sense, it could be really integrated in the city and came up with an idea, something like this, of a rooftop hyper-urban baseball stadium. Um, you could make, I mean, I could imagine events happening even in corporate buildings across the way, you know, trying to, to eke out all of the, the, the opportunities for this event. So we tried to make this work, actually, try to um, build a model of the city, and we found out that the footprint of the building we picked was too small, so we thought of an expanding seating bowl, bowl uh, that would deploy... Um, reaching across the streets, and uh, we build this um, motorized model. We, we worked really with a, um, an engineer early in this, too. We were looking at the way that this would move. As you can see, the slabs are maintain their horizontality um, as they rotate. Um, in addition to this, which we haven't built this stadium yet, uh, but... We also did some uh, an exhibition about the baseball research, which we used, um, exhibited on baseball cards. Uh, this is a structure made out of bent baseball cards. I think we used something like 20,000 baseball cards. One side of this wall was um, printed with was the actual baseball cards, and the other side that you're looking at here was all the research just made in miniature and printed onto the baseball cards uh, with these different models. And another um, urban research project that we completed, and this was more just a fun project in the office. We were, we were sitting around. A lot of times we react to articles we see in the newspaper, and we get together and, and talk about those things. And one of, one of the articles was about how Chicago was planning on building a casino, but they wanted to build the casino. You know, it was going to either be on a riverboat or um, it was going to be out at the airport. And we thought, 
you know, what a shame because you could, you know, maybe you could make a casino that would really be more like an eco casino, something downtown that would be located right on the train line and, you know, it, it would be able to kind of bring these two, two things that are seemingly different together, like responding to the environment that's at the same time like being this um, pleasure palace. And um, this is the typical casino around in the Midwest that you see. And, you know, what a wasted opportunity. So um, our idea was to create these postcards that I showed you. And we, we, we made some images of the eco casino, and we, we made these postcards as if it already existed. And then we sent them around to, um, to some of the politicians and uh, legislators and interested parties um, and to try to, to put the idea out there that the casino could actually be a downtown building. We thought of things like maybe you could, instead of betting on, you know, craps or something, <laughs> bet on the weather. <laughs> then I found out that people really do that. <laughs> um, on the rooftop, you could have these solar-powered slot machines. <laughs> and these were just these were the series of postcards. Well, lo and behold, we were we were finally called down to the mayor's office to to try to explain this idea of the eco casino. And and the city did make an attempt to get a land-based um, casino um, in in Chicago. And I, I, the, it's still up in the air where it finally will land. But it wasn't as if we were trying to kind of get a project to do an eco-casino. We were just trying to put that idea into the public consciousness, which I think architects have the power to do because we can work with words and images and ideas. Um, this next project is a real project. Um, I'm just going to drop this. Um, this is the, the site for the aqua tower that you saw in the beginning of the lecture, um, but this is 100 years ago. And what Chicago looked like on the waterfront um, in 1893. And what's amazing about this picture to me is that, you know, it, it, it looks virtually impossible for a human being to, to get over to the waterfront. Our project is situated right in this area. And think about how much a city can change in 100 years. Um, today, this is the Chicago waterfront. Uh, the rail is under underground partially here and now you know the city is really much more about quality of life and recreation at least in the, this waterfront area um, it's completely redefined cultural institutions like the the shed aquarium are located here the field museum um, and and so this new project this high rise is really about um, bringing people to live back in the city, right in the downtown of the city. Um, we, it's called Aqua. When we started doing this project, just like the other ones, I mean, some people, I guess, would say we overanalyze things, but um, we wanted to figure out, you know, what does it mean to do a high-rise in the city? <laughs> so we started looking at density. And density is um, measured in households per acre. This is some um, really interesting research that we found through the uh, Center for Neighborhood Technologies and, uh, that researches these things. And we've, we found that um, in an 82-story tower, which is what Aqua is, we could have 738 households. So basically, you're around 2,300 2, households per acre. This is comparing it to a typical uh, suburban lot that's just a screen grab from Google Earth drawing it out, um, diagramming it. This is a real suburban development, which is only 2.2 households per acre. And, and the, through the Center for Neighborhood Technology, they've actually looked at what does it mean in terms of the CO2 produced um, per household. And, and this is um, showing you that in the typical suburb, you're right around uh, 12 tons of CO2 produced per household per year. And as you get denser, um, it, that just reduces and it goes down. Um, aqua is off the chart here, but it's, it's you know, under two tons of CO2 per household. 
And the reason is because it's, it's not just the commute in and out of the city to work, it's also every time you want a gallon of milk, you have to get in the car. And so, so the, the, there really is a direct correspondence with density and reducing uh, CO2. On that site that I was showing you, this is, um, this is where the Illinois Center um, was located. It was a former terminus for the Illinois Central Railroad. And um, the site was partially developed as business. And then this developer that we're working with um, came in and wanted to um, bring more residential to this, to this downtown site. This, this is a map from 1933 WPA map. Um, so the site partially, these are the business um, buildings here. They, they did a master plan with SOM uh, that, that located all this new housing around a central park, a neighborhood park. Um, and, and what we're in charge of designing is, is a huge piece of this. It's that orange part there. It includes the tower. Um, it includes a ballroom for this hotel next door two public stairs, um, a business, uh, an office building, um, a hotel lobby, and restaurants and retail. Again, we were getting kind of analytical, doing some modeling early in the process, um, building a big piece of the city, and, and realizing that you know when the building is finally there, when it's by the time Aqua is finally built, there'll be a lot of other buildings around it too. And one of the criteria really was try to preserve views. I mean, that's, that's the selling point for high-rise buildings. Um, we, we were looking at the views and found that you know, some of the views were hard to actually get. So we created a model that had these bump outs on it. It's very rough here. You can see it in the background and, and connected uh, these sight lines or strings to the different bumps so that by bumping out the building you'd be able to actually get views around corners or unexpected views from this tower. And um, as we shaped the building further, it really became this almost like a topographic tower, a landscape turned upright that had hills on it and the hills are responding to specific views. So instead of trying to make an iconic tower, you know, with a sketch, a cartoon of a building, uh, we really were responding specifically to this site. At that point, we, we decided we could, the bumps, the hills, could really be defined by the floor plates. Again, this is thinking about the material. The material of a high rise would be concrete and glass, basically, in the, in today. And um, we could define these hills with the slabs. This image is a landscape up in the, around the Great Lakes, picture of limestone that's worn away by water, wind, and time. It, we weren't trying to replicate how this looks, but we're very interested in the parallel with, with how the processes could start to shape the aqua tower. Of course, it wasn't called aqua then. It was just called like building P or something like that. So, we, we came up with these, started to further define the hills on the building, and now they're, they're starting to respond to the units inside. They're starting to respond to uh, the sun pattern, uh, deeper ones on the south than the north, and so on. Many other criteria start to shape the building. Um, looking at how they're overlaid, you can see uh, there's something like 80, well, there's 82 different slabs on this building. Each one is slightly different. None are the same, um, which I found out typically why architects like to do tall buildings. They can just repeat the floor plan. Well, we came up with a way to avoid that, too. Um, we, we, this is a model in the, in the sales center, actually. They hit, they, interestingly, the developer had to, had to sell the, the units based on the size of their terrace because they had different values. And they finally gave up and just said, okay, we're just going to call them small, medium, and large <laughs> for sales point. Um, this, this is a drawing showing, you know, some of the places on that model, the, the slabs were disappearing into the face of the building. So we identified those places, which are these shapes 
Um, and we changed the glass type in those areas to put a higher performing glass in the areas where there's more solar uh, heat gain. And we called these pools because they have a, like a higher reflectivity. And here you can see the, uh, what the shape of, of that is looking like. And it's, it's nice because as the building is being constructed, those, those are becoming visible and people are um, noticing that and asking what, why is that, um, what is that reflective area on the building. So in a way we're letting these criteria, you know, the, the hills, the slabs, the pools, the, the expandral opacity, the, the columns, all define what, what the building ultimately is. So it's, a, it's this product of these different criteria. Another shot. This is the um, rendering of the base. There's a really large uh, roof garden, something like 80,000 square feet. It will be the largest rooftop garden in the city when it's finished. In, in construction, um, I, I don't know why the high rise was invented to be you know, in Chicago, because our soil is probably the worst soil you could imagine. We have to build caissons. This is a 12-foot diameter caisson um, that is under the building. And some of the bars on this caisson were, I'd, I'd never seen a number 20 bar before, but it's on this. But the way that the slabs are made to be different, again, um, we had to work very closely with the people making the building, the tradesmen and the contractor, um, and they found a gauge of steel, which is right here, that's the slab edge um, formwork. They found a gauge that was a perfect um, thickness that it could be used and reused on each floor, bent into a new shape um, as, as the building goes up. So the way that it's done is um, there's a robotic uh, tool, robotic survey tool here where uh, this uh, surveyor brings up the, the drawings on his handheld machine and then are able to plot out these different slabs on each floor and it really is not added any time to the construction whatsoever. So for, and that was one of the big criteria because if you think about it, if you're just adding four hours per day to each floor, it adds up and pretty soon the building takes six months more to make. So that was one of the really important things about doing this high rise. This is a construction photo as you can see the starting to put the, uh, the glass in and um, prior to sealing the slabs. This is a picture I took from, uh, I think it was last winter, February, it was freezing. <laughs> and uh, uh, leaned out over, just took a shot to, to show that, you know, what, it, what that space is gonna be like when you're actually inhabiting the facade of this building. You know, most, most tall buildings are very um, enclosed and you can't walk out to the outside. And these are all habitable terraces that don't have their handrails yet. Um, and <laughs> But it's quite interesting, and I thought I was really daring when I did that until I saw this photo <laughs> um, of one of the guys putting down uh, track for the for the window wall. So, uh, what's been interesting in doing the high rise, you know, you, we've we've always developed this um, relationship with people making the buildings because I think there, there are secrets of the material to be unlocked and so on. And with this building, I really have gotten to know the, the concrete, especially the concrete workers, pretty well. Um, and I think they finally started to accept me. They made this T-shirt <laughs> with me in the middle and um, gave it out to all the contractors that work on the building. This is, you can see here, starting to, the, the, the handrails are not um, corresponding 100% to the curves, although they are curved, but each, each um, unit has its own terrace defined by that handrail. And looking up, it's really becoming very three-dimensional. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. So you, it's a building that you really have to go up and look up at 
Um, from far away, it really is much more of a simple rectangular volume. Um, here's an image of maybe a few weeks ago, um, getting close to the top. And then this was last week, and we topped out last week, which was very exciting, um, up at the top 80, 82 stories. And they bring up a bucket with a flag on top of the bucket with the last bucket of concrete, which I got to pull down the handle, which was a lot of fun. Um, so so th those are kind of buildings that are really involved with the city and urban um, environment, uh, the, the baseball stadiums and the high rises. Um, but, and I'm going to quickly go through where we've gone with this idea of density uh, since starting Aqua. There's a, a building now that we're doing on the south side in Hyde Park, um, President Obama's neighborhood. This is our, our building. This is a, a Museum of Science and Industry, and we got this site that faces straight south. So in this case, uh, we were really interested in seeing if we could shape the building based on the solar orientation. Um, is it possible to, to kind of carve the building with the, the sunlight? And we, we came up with the idea of, of these facets. So instead of overhangs like we have in aqua, um, because those are uninsulated uh, balconies. This time we, we've shaped the building uh, to respond to the solar angle so that during, during the summer the sun is kept out and the winter um, sun can come in. And it was the first model trying that. We did it in tiers on the building so that you would um, be able to do it again and, and get a taller building. This is the final height. 26 stories. Um, and this has worked out really well. We're, we're going for a, a higher lead rating here, um, silver, but it looks like we'll definitely you know, be in contention for gold on this building. So the way that works is you can see in December the sun's coming in, and then that, that angle keeps the sun out in the summer. Another view of it, and the inside it really has an incredible spatial effect too, because you're standing um, in the in the space and it's really expanding out from you. But as, as I said, we're looking at the criteria of of living, and here you know this is just developer logic: bigger units on top, smaller units at the bottom, and we tried to use that logic to to create a pattern, which is almost kind of like an algorithmic pattern. Um, as it moves up these different tiers in the building. It's a model. This is supposed to be starting construction uh, this year in the fall. And the side walls, we were in, it, you know, these are the shear walls for the building. Um, and we wanted to puncture them to take away some of the material that was not necessary. Started out with looking at different patterns and, and finally went to our engineers and asked them, you know, can you, can you tell us what pattern is the force diagram on the building? Um, and they came back with, with this. And um, we just used it. We, we just took it directly. It's an unusual building because it's wider at the top than it is the bottom. And then it has these um, chiseled um, front areas on the south-facing facade. So it created something that was asymmetrical, which is very exciting. I think with our tools today, we're able to do this much finer grained uh, study of the structure instead of overstructuring it and just producing you know symmetry for for the sake of simplicity the ground level and then this is what it looks at from above and you, you know you might see that our practice is kind of a lot of the projects have been in Chicago and about this time um, we were asked by Tishman Spire and and actually by Harry Cobb uh, to participate in a plan of a city in, in India. So with the familiarity that we have with our own city, how do you take that and go into a completely different country, a different culture, and how do you make something that resonates uh, with that culture? And I'll just show you briefly um, where we're going with that project. It's in Hyderabad, which is the center of India. Um, we were really, this is for housing, you know, for, to house um, 
all of, of the people working in the tech industry in, in Hyderabad. And there are people that have been living in towns, cities with very low-rise um, dwellings. And we are interested in these havelis, which is a building type in India. So we started by like really researching what we could through books and everything at home, um, and ultimately went to India to find more, to try to learn more about that place. But what's interesting about these buildings is they, they have an open courtyard, and they really shade the street, which is really crucial to um, this climate. And they provide a nice sense of privacy indoors. So when you look from, at the city from the top, you can see all the different courtyard housing. And another characteristic um, is the use of the rooftop, which is quite nice. And everybody goes out there for different reasons, um, from sleeping in the summer to kite flying and things like that. Another thing that we found was the, um, these wells, step wells, which are amazing places in India. So this idea of the cavity, uh, the void, and we wanted to do a building that incorporated this, this void and, and made shade. So we, when we went to India with a group of other architects working on these different parcels, um, we found that the site was really, you know, there was almost nothing there except for off the screen there is a tech center. So this is really a whole new town uh, that, that Harry Cobb was developing with Hishman Spire and, and had assigned architects different plots to develop. So we went there with a lot of different architects. It, the heat was scorching. I mean, you really got a sense of the climate. It was an amazing place. Um, of course, the architects always wearing black, and we were burning up <laughs> as we were looking at the site. Um, so we, we um, came up with this idea of a courtyard tower that would be naturally ventilated. And here you can see the initial concept for it. And we also worked together um, with um, Doshi uh, when we were there in a workshop um, think, talking about the ideas and trying to make them more resonating with um, the local culture. So the, the courtyard works to shade the site. Um, this, is, this shows the, how small our project was in relation to the overall site that has this um, amazing green space in it. And this, this courtyard, would, like I said, it naturally ventilates. It allows for rooftops to be inhabited through these erosions in the cube. Um, and then we do some interesting things with water collection in the site. Around the edges of the erosions were these faceted um, edges where people could have semi-public um, space balconies where they could communicate. This is an image of the overall tower um, with its gaps, and some of the spaces created that were semi-public spaces um, within the volume of the tower. So the Haveli Street, and then the cracks in our in our courtyard tower. So finally, just to wrap up, I wanted to show a few of the projects. I think I'll just show one that is more about this idea of interpreting a site. Uh, this is the Ford Calumet Environmental Center. It's a, it's a community center, a competition that we won um, in 2004, uh, so long ago. Um, but it took a while for the city to get the land. And for us, we finally started and completed our drawings. So the status of this project right now is, is going into construction this year. Um, it's very exciting. Um, it's a place where people come to learn about this environment, which is a site of Calumet. It's a place where um, is known for its industry and steel production. Um, and it's also a place that has become a very important habitat. I'll, I'll come back to this image in a second. That's the, the building from outside. This, this, so we're really interpreting this site for people to understand why it's important. It, like I said, it's located amongst what used to be all the steel mills producing almost 
all the steel for um, the country, um, was very active in World War II producing steel. Um, and then slowly those steel mills started to shut down. In their place, there's still a, a massive uh, connection of industry that is dealing in salvaged materials. And all the places in red are places that had materials that had potential architectural um, significance. It's also, like I said, it's on this migratory bird route, like many cities on waterways, and it's become a stopping point for mi migratory birds. So the, the we, we had the idea that, you know, like a bird, maybe we could make this building uh, like a bird makes a nest using all of this nearby material, uh, thrown out material, abundant material uh, to create the building. So it really wasn't about the form, it was really about how to make this building. Um, we found out that salvaged steel is weld marked with the place that it was produced. So maybe we could make columns, bundled columns, um, that would be salvaged steel. Salvaged steel columns would be columns that were rejected because maybe they had flash rusting or maybe they were slightly bent but they would be perfectly fine for using in a building and we could expose their differences and you know, make, make a series of columns that are almost like um, a categorizing where the steel came from on the site. Structurally, we use the columns also as piles, so they're, they're driven in on angles um, into this wet clayey soil that exists in the Calumet area. So that way, we're really reducing the amount of site disturbance um, on the site. Like I said, this is a site that's on the migratory bird path. What's really amazing I learned through the project was that you can see birds from um, South America coming through this Chicago like twice a year. And it's an amazing event that's almost invisible. But I started to become much more aware of it. Um, Mississippi Flyway. As we were doing the research for this project, we discovered um, some really kind of disturbing news that cities located on waterways um, are really deadly for birds. Something like 93 million birds die every year colliding with glass that they cannot see in America alone. So that I mean, the scary part of that is it's like making architects the biggest killers of birds ever. So <laughs> we, it's actually it's the second um, biggest threat. The first biggest threat is loss of habitat. Second biggest threat is collisions with glass. That's just a collection of birds from one day in, during migratory season uh, collected of birds that uh, hit windows in Chicago. So we came up with um, an idea, and we, we worked with a professor of ornithology uh, to, who had actually studied this effect, that to make the, the, to make the birds safe and to make a um, glass visible, you can put a screen on the outside layer of the glass that, that birds can see. And that way, you know, we could avoid killing these birds people are coming to see in the building. Um, we also turned that into an opportunity to create a space, a place for people. It's a place to, to bird watch. It's almost like a bird blind um, that would be made, defined by these recycled, re salvaged steel um, screens. So conceptually, the building is really taking this thing that's thrown out and weaving it into something very beautiful. So the concept of the column clusters and black and the screen that's an early sketch. This is uh, the final elevation, par partial elevation of the drawing here. And what was really nice about this screen was as we, as we developed it and responded to the structural criteria and so on, it really got more variety and more difference along, along the um, outside edge. Inside uh, model, very large model to study the spaces. In plan, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's these pods. Uh, there's exhibition space that winds around the pods. The pods have classrooms 
and other um, spaces such as labs and the big porch running along the south side of the building. We're using other recycled material in the building too to, to make that almost like the theme of reuse for the building. One of them is slag, seen here. Slag is a byproduct. Here it is um, in its raw state. It's a byproduct of steel production. And we thought, why not try to use that, incorporate it into um, a, a terrazzo floor. And so we've done a number of tests with this material, with different um, compositions. And there's also a, a, a wood, one of the last sawmills in the city of Chicago nearby. So we're using wood for the, the formwork. And then we're going to reuse that wood for the, um, the porch deck. And we're using a recycled, this is a um, wood material from you know, wine barrels that we're reusing on the exterior. This is the north elevation of the building. So the building really is this kind of organism. It's going for a lead platinum, so we have, you know, really connected into the site using geothermal. We're using a, um, a labyrinth for, for delivery of air, um, a biomass boiler using some of the site material as for intense heating in the winter. It's, I'm, I have two other projects, but I'm not going to show them. I'm going to end right here and um, take questions. Um, thank you very much for having me.